apologies. Uh, oh, this is being recorded, just letting you know. Um, big apologies for last week. We had some technical issues with the, uh, with the Zoom webinar. So thank you very much for coming to join us again today. Um, before we start, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional landholders of uh, the land in which we are uh, coming from today. Um, we're obviously spread out throughout Australia, uh, but I'm uh, zooming in from Wollongong, which is the land of the Darawal people and the Wadi Wadi tribe. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to um, uh, these, these traditional landholders. Um, so today we have a terrific talk from another ARC Centre of Excellence. This is from Dark Matter. And so today we have Maxim Goryachev, I hope I've said that correctly, um, from the University of Western Australia, uh, and also from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Dark Matter. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about some uh, experiments into some low energy searches for new physics. So thanks very much, Maxim, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Okay, thank you for the introduction and for these opportunities to speak to you today. So yes, my talk will be about uh, low energy searches for new physics. And in this talk, I represent the uh, Center of Excellence for Dark Matter. So uh, Dark Matter constitutes 23% of everything in the universe, which is much larger portion of everything comparing to what we can or uh, what we see. Uh, so this is a huge problem for modern physics. And uh, the center is all about finding what dark matter is and uh, studying its properties. Um, why I was so sure that dark matter exists is because there is an overwhelming number of uh, signs that uh, it is in our galaxies. Here is a short list of uh, evidences. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I, I just want to highlight, for example, rotation of galaxies, uh, where we have to add dark matter in order to fit uh, our models to uh, astrophysical observations. Uh, the problem with dark matter is that we don't know its properties. Particularly, we don't know uh, masses of dark matter particles. And these masses can spread from uh, thousands of there are electron volts here down to 10 to minus 21 electron volts. So it's a huge parameter space. And of course, we can't cover everything in just one experiment. So the dark matter center uh, supports uh, quite a few experiments. So on the higher energy end, we have Saber, uh, LHC, and Cygnus. Uh, on the lower end, we have uh, Axion searches like Organ and ADMX. And today in my talk, I'll talk about this end and even below this micro EV scale. So uh, these are the four themes of the center. So it's about direct detection, precision metrology, LHC and theory. I also want to acknowledge another center of excellence, which is called the Center of Excellence for Engineered Quantum Systems. And this center is all about designing uh, quantum materials, quantum enabled imaging and diagnostics and quantum engines. So uh, these quantum, <clears throat> instruments and detection, uh, detection schemes help us in our searches for dark matter. So to show this, I want to highlight this uh, um, uh, conference which happened last year and uh, where they underlined that uh, the future of searches for dark matter and generally for new physics is in quantum technology. Uh, so this is our lab. Um, have excellent students who participate in all of these experiments and I also want to highlight our uh, website where you can take a virtual tour of our lab. So this is the outline of my talk today. I'll start with uh, some axion searches, then I'll move on to Lorentz invariance tests, quantum gravity, uh, high frequency gravitational waves and light scalar dark matter where uh, for the first time I'll show you some positive detections without uh, actually claiming what that is. And finally, if I have time, I'll describe some R&D related to light WIMP. Uh, so this is um, uh, the last part became possible due to our new center and due to our collaboration with the University of Melbourne. So uh, I start with axions. Axions are hypothetical uh, elementary particles uh, which were invented to solve the strong CP problem. The problem is uh, why the uh, 
QCD respects the CP symmetry and axions are the particles which solve the problem. It also turns out that axions are excellent candidates for dark matter. They have all the right properties to be dark matter. Uh, what's important for us that axions do interact with light. Uh, so here in this diagram, you see that a photon can interact with an axion and the coupling is uh, this parameter G A gamma gamma, which um, describes the strength of axion interaction with the electromagnetism. So typically um, we have uh, uh, two phenomenological models. And uh, since we don't know the maps, uh, uh, people present these models as a band on this kind of plot. So on the X axis, we have mass of axions. So we're talking about micro EV scale here, uh, a milli EV scale. And this is GA gamma gamma. So this is coupling to um, electromagnetism. And the QCD axions would cover this yellow band here. Everything else on this plot would be an axion-like particle. And you also can see a number of uh, experiments which exclude those kinds of particles in various experiments. So how can we detect uh, axions? And we can detect it through the uh, inverse Primakov effect. So the idea of this is we have a strong electromagnetic uh, field. Uh, typically in an experiment, they use a strong DC field. So it's a virtual photon. It interacts with the axions and produce a real photon. A frequency of this photon is related to the mass of the axions plus minus some velocity correction. And this is how a typical uh, axion searching experiment would look like. So we have a cavity. You, you should think about the cavity like an, about an antenna. So uh, it's, it collects uh, photons produced through the uh, inverse Primakov effect. So since we don't know the mass, we also need a kind of tuning mechanisms where we tune our antenna on the axion resonance. And then we have very low noise amplification stage, which gives us a kind of uh, axion signal. So uh, this experiment uh, was first implemented in the ADMX uh, collaboration. So this is axion dark matter experiment, uh, which is probably the largest and the most famous one. And we are uh, proudly a uh, part of this um, experiment. So, um, so this is how it looks like in the lab. And since we don't know the, uh, the uh, frequency or the mass, we need to scan. And a figure of merit for such experiment is a scan rate. So how much of parameter space can we exclude uh, in a unit of time? This is a complicated formula, but what's important for us that uh, it's uh, proportional to uh, magnetic field B here, mode volume, quality factor of our cavity, and temperature. So it has to be at very low temperatures, very huge magnetic fields, and uh, it has to be done some material science and uh, very low, uh, uh, very low uh, noise temperature amplification. So even uh, in this case, uh, the signal would be very tiny. So we're talking about a ridiculously tiny amount of power extracted from uh, the axion field. Uh, these are some preliminary plots. Uh, uh, ADMX is running right now, and it keeps excluding QCD axions. Here we are talking about uh, something around three micro EV scale. Um, this is um, some uh, other experiments like Haystack and some projections for future work, for example, till 2026. And they are going into tens of micro EVs. Um, here at UWA, we have our own axion search experiment, which is called Organ. So in this experiment, we are aiming at much higher uh, masses. Uh, it is like something on an order of 100 micro EV scale or 15 to 50 gigahertz range. It's very well uh, theoretically motivated by theories like SMASH. Also, there is a um, strange experimental observations at those frequencies using Josephson junctions. Uh, but this uh, mass range is very complicated. So everything works against us when we go higher in uh, mass. For example, mode volumes get lower, quality factors get worse, and temperatures, noise temperatures get higher. So these experiments are more challenging. So this was our first pilot experiment um, published in 2017, we had, where we had just a copper cavity, a semiconductor amplifier here. Everything was in uh, at four Kelvin in, in the 70, 7 Tesla magnet. And we were able to exclude a very tiny piece of 
the parameter space here. So you can see that uh, the, uh, the organ experiment is at much higher uh, axion mass relative to the ADMX. And these were our projections at that time. So by now we have all three important ingredients for an uh, axion search. We have a fridge. This is our new dilution fridge here. Uh, we have a magnet, which is a 12 Tesla magnet. We have a cryogenic translation stage, which is important for tuning. And we are also working hard on the detection side where we, we um, are working with gigahertz uh, signal photon detectors. This is a new technology which is supported by ECHOS. And these are our projection plots uh, at this stage. So here we have the uh, QCD axions, this band here. We also present ALP cogenesis, which is another uh, important um, theoretical model. And this is what we can exclude uh, using either uh, semiconductor amplifiers or quantum limited uh, linear amplifiers. But if we do have efficient gigahertz single photon detectors, we can immediately exclude the um, QCD axions, which would be great. Um, uh, in addition to implementing a traditional kind of helescope, we are working hard on other detection schemes. Uh, for example, in this upload download experiment, uh, where we have the idea that what if instead of DC magnetic field, we have two uh, real photons and we have a cavity and uh, let's um, design our cavity in such a way that um, those two nodes are cross polarized. So we maximize uh, the interaction through axions. And if we do the math and uh, we figure out what happens to the modes, we can see that uh, we can produce either beam splitter interaction between the two modes due to the presence of the dark matter axions, or we can produce uh, parametric amplification uh, of these two modes due to the presence of uh, dark matter axions. And this is what we call up or down conversion loop oscillator axion detection. So uh, this principle is based on uh, frequency or phase metrology. So instead of measuring uh, power coming from an antenna, we measure phase fluctuations induced on two microwave or optical modes in the presence of axions. So axions uh, couple to nodes and produce uh, variations of phase and or um, frequencies. And so this is the power spectrum density of such a plot uh, of, of such a uh, uh, fluctuations produced by axions. And what's important here is that this power spectral density is proportional to the ratios of amplitudes, or the signal is basically proportional to the ratio of uh, power stored in one loop to the power stored in the other loop. So the signal is not proportional to a bare amplitude, which is very important. So we don't need very high magnetic fields or where it's high powers uh, and we can achieve our goal just by uh, tuning this knob and uh, tuning the ratio of these amplitudes. Um, so uh, this approach has quite a few advantages over the traditional uh, detection approach. Basically it's magnet free. We don't need any crazy magnets anymore. It's volume independent. We can go to high frequencies. We are not limited by power. Power can be quite limited and the best uh, sensitivity will be achieved at four Kelvin rather than at millikelvin temperatures. And there are quite a few other advantages uh, relative to the traditional approach. So this is a scheme which we implemented and you can see a cavity, it's coupled to two microwave loops and everything else is a detection scheme. So this is how it looks like on a, a desktop bench. So this is a copper cavity with two nodes cross polarized, it's tunable. And everything else is just uh, low noise microwave electronics uh, designed to support oscillations and a detection scheme. And this was our uh, first result, which is a busy plot, but I'll explain what it means. So this is axion frequency or mass. This is the uh, coupling coefficients. Uh, this is the traditional uh, QCD axion model bands. This is alpha genesis, and this is our exclusion plot. It seems like it's uh, not so sensitive as, for example, the cost experiment or other experiments, but we have to, uh, I have to say that this was achieved in a matter of uh, tens of minutes 
in a, a setup which sits on a desk bench. So it's no cryogenics, nothing, but uh, it's a very simple experiment. So by implementing, implementing a cryogenic scheme, we can achieve a much higher sensitivity and exclude at least all cryogenesis. And this is a much, of course, much cheaper experiment than a traditional hyloscope. At this point, I want to change gears and talk to you about uh, something quite different, and this is about Lorentz violations. So um, Lorentz symmetry is uh, something which is uh, uh, which relates to a model. It's uh, not like something approved or uh, anything. So it's uh, uh, something uh, which can be broken in, in reality. And this was underlined by Alan Kostelecki and his colleagues in 1997 and 1998. And he basically said that um, the theory of everything uh, can include those violations. And let's um, write down some standard model extension, which is just uh, an effective field theory, which includes the standard model GR and all, also, all possible operators that break the Lorentz symmetry. And the idea behind that is that this uh, standard model extension does not explain why that happens, but rather gives us a framework to compare different experiments, which um, um, put bounds on those kinds of violations. So since then, they published uh, tables of those coefficients in matter, photon, neutrino, and gravity sectors. And probably the most uh, famous of those is the Lorentz symmetry in the photon sector, where we talk about uh, symmetries of the speed of light or a modern Michelson mole experiment. And in this work, this is probably the, stringent, uh, the most stringent uh, limit on this kind of violation. Uh, they also say that uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry can be broken in other sectors, for example, the uh, matter sector, where we talk about masses of elementary particles like electron, proton, and neutron, and this is what we are going to test in this work. So uh, how can we test uh, these ideas? Basically, th this is to say that uh, masses of elementary particles are different in different directions in the universe, and we can do this experimentally by implementing a um, mechanical oscillator whose mass, uh, whose frequency is proportional to mass. And if the Lorentz symmetry is broken, the frequency would be proportional to the orientation of this uh, mechanical oscillator in space. Instead of a bare uh, mechanical oscillator, we would use a clock based on uh, this mechanical oscillator. And then we can measure frequency variations of this clock, which we can directly relate to the Lorentz symmetry violation coefficients, these uh, C numbers here. So because clocks are something we can actually measure in a lab rather than just um, some other parameter. So for this work, we use bulk acoustic wave cavity, which is an acoustic analog of a famous uh, Fabry-Pirot type of cavities. So instead of uh, phonon bouncing from mirrors, uh, here we have a phonon bouncing from uh, interfaces between the crystal, this, uh, gray uh, slab here and forming an, a resonance. Uh, this is a planar convex form. Uh, it is made to uh, concentrate all the uh, energy in the center of the disk. So we can clamp the disk at its edges. edges. Uh, so uh, typically we use uh, piezoelectric electric materials so we can effectively couple to the uh, mechanical resonance, but we uh, put those electrodes on the supporting structure rather than on the disk itself to achieve the highest possible quality factor. So here we are talking about frequency range between one megahertz and one gigahertz. We have three uh, mode families, piezoelectric electric coupling and uh, extremely high quality factors reaching 10 billion. And this is what we used to build um, oscillators. So these are two quartz uh, bulk acoustic wave oscillators. We put those on a turntable and basically measure frequency deviation between the, these two. And this is what's presented in this uh, first test of uh, Lorentz symmetry using quartz oscillators. So um, in this work, we achieve frequency stability uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 15. Uh, and using this number, we can deduce the neutron sector coefficient of 10 to the minus 4 14 GeV, and this is a few orders of magnitude improvement over all previous laboratory observations on astrophysical bounds. 
So I, I should underline that this was achieved with 120 hours of observations. So now we uh, published another paper where we discussed how to uh, improve this setup. And basically by now we have more than halfway, uh, 1.5 years of observations. So we, we will be able to put in uh, a more lower bounds on these kinds of uh, Lorentz violation coefficients. Um, here I switch to something related and is about quantum gravity. So this is another problem uh, of modern physics where we have to find how uh, quantum mechanics can be uh, linked to gravity and how these two things can go together in experiments. And one idea was um, introduced uh, a long time ago and basically the idea is that the uh, commutation relationship between your uh, position and momentum of your mechanical oscillator can deviate from the standard uh, commutator in a case where the mass of your oscillator is larger than the Planck mass. So uh, by detecting all these uh, violations, you can put bounds on, the on quantum gravity. And this is the way to parameterize this idea. So you have your commutator here. Uh, this is the standard term IH bar. But in addition to that, we have this term, which is related to Planck mass and to a momentum. And this beta coefficient is something we can put bounds on. So of course, modifying the commutation relationship would modify the uh, your uncertainty principle. Uh, which you can measure in an experiment, but that will be very hard because it's hard to measure uh, quantum fluctuations of a massive object. But uh, doing this uh, also means that we effectively modify our Hamiltonian and um, an effective Hamiltonian in this case would look like this. So in addition to uh, traditional kinetic and uh, potential energy, we have a nonlinear term, which is fourth order in uh, uh, momentum and it's also uh, related to the Planck mass. So putting bounds on those kinds of nonlinearities in linear mechanical oscillator, we can put bounds on the uh, quantum gravity modifications. So uh, this is shown in this plot here. So we have mass of our mechanical oscillator. It's X scale here. This is uh, beta and uh, these are the two experiments which we presented in this work. So we used the bulk acoustic wave devices, which we used also for Lorentz invariance. So this is this dot here. And we also use a sapphire split bar resonator in an optomechanical scheme uh, in order to put bounds uh, in, high, in, in even larger mass range. So, and now we also have a clear idea how to improve these bounds to, um, uh, to, to be able to exclude those kinds of variations. Um, now I move on to high frequency gravitational waves. Uh, before um, light interferometers like LIGO be became operational, people used the uh, split bar resonators, uh, I, I mean um, bar resonators to detect gravitational waves. Uh, one of them you can see here, this is a, a detector which is a bulk niobium bar and it was constructed at UWA in uh, mid 90s. And this was the first uh, object to demonstrate uh, optomechanical um, uh, effects. And uh, now all, all these kinds of detectors uh, using acoustic waves or mechanics uh, seem very outdated related to the light interferometers. But it might be not true if we change the objective of our search. So instead of low uh, frequency gravitational waves, what if we are going to look for higher frequencies, say in the range of one megahertz to one gigahertz. And it turns out that using very high Q mechanical oscillators, we can achieve very reasonable and very good sensitiv strain sensitivity. If we couple those, um, devices to very low noise with amplifiers at 20 millikelvin. And this is what we demonstrated in this work here back in 2014. And we also mentioned that those objects have multiple nodes and we can sample the uh, frequency space in many places and you get an idea or put bounds on all possible sources of high frequency gravitational waves. 
Um, this is a kind of sensitivity plot, so have multiple modes. Uh, we can achieve something on the order of 10 to the minus 22 uh, per square root hertz. And this is quite good, especially we can do this at millikelvin temperatures. Uh, so uh, the detector will look like this. So have an acoustic uh, device, which is again our bulk acoustic wave course cavity coupled to uh, a squid amplifier. Uh, this superconducting loop here, and uh, simultaneously we can measure quite a few mechanical modes. So here you can see uh, Nyquist noise coming from this high Q uh, acoustic cavity, and we can simultaneously measure uh, many of those. Uh, the first question people ask about this work is about possible sources of, uh, at those frequencies. And uh, we should recognize that these are mostly hypothetical objects, but there are quite a few theories showing that there might be something out there. For example, uh, primordial black hole mergers or something like this. And we can't exclude them until we look and measure and put bounds on those kinds of objects. And this was summarized in this work here. This is um, a work by theorists and experimentalists showing uh, all possible sources at higher frequencies and megahertz, gigahertz frequency range, as well as uh, experiments uh, or planned experiments in, in this frequency range. And I would refer you to this paper to look for uh, sources. And uh, this is the result of our work. We ran our uh, detector for 153 days and we were able to detect free events, very strong events. So um, this was from 2019 to 2020, and uh, we saw only three events, one of which was quite um, uh, weak, but two were uh, very strong. And this is how a single event looks like. So this is a oscillator decay process. The decay time perfectly corresponds to the quality factor of our mechanical oscillator. So we are sure that it is produced inside what is related to the mechanical resonance. Um, uh, and it appears in two modes in all four quarters of two modes. We can immediately exclude some of the uh, possible sources, for example, weather, earthquakes, uh, cosmic showers, things like that. But there are also a number of other possibilities, like we recognize that it might be due to some internal solid state processes in, in these crystals or some radioactive events. So um, by, uh, now we are building a second generation of this detector where we have two uh, antennas in parallel and we were able to monitor the environment much better. So uh, these results were summarized in this work. Uh, where you can read about the experiments and uh, about all possible uh, sources. Um, it also has been pointed out by our colleagues that this kind of detector is sensitive not only to high frequency gravitational waves, but also to um, uh, scalar dark matter. Uh, the idea here is that uh, scalar dark matter modifies the Bohr radius, and by that it kind of pushes the uh, uh, the, the resonator and they related the um, uh, dark matter coupling coefficients to the strain sensitivity of an antenna. And this is, and this was their exclusion plot. So we are talking about micro EV uh, um, dark matter uh, masses. And this is the coupling coefficients and they put our work on, the, on this plot to show that it's, uh, it's possible to use to exclude some of these theories. There are quite a few uh, ideas, very similar ideas out there. Um, for example, this is another one using uh, uh, dark matter candidates called moduli. Um, and that they also say that various mechanical oscillators can be used uh, to put bounds on those kinds of dark matter in kilohertz to gigahertz frequency range. Again, they put our experiment to, to say that it's also sensitive and it can exclude those kinds of dark matter candidates. Yet another work here uh, showing explicitly how the fine structure constant of the electric magnetism is related to the, uh, the scalar dark matter phi here. 
and this is the coupling coefficient. It also modifies masses of particles, and you see the mass scale. But they actually say that it is it, it might be much more advantageous to use oscillators instead of bare mechanical resonators. And this is what we uh, done in this work, where we use photonic, atomic, and mechanical oscillators to put bounds on um, fundamental constant on variations of fundamental constants. For so for the mechanical oscillator, we use again the quartz bulk acoustic wave oscillator. For the photonic degree of freedom, we use the um, cryogenic sapphire clock. And for the atomic, we used an H maser. So by combining these three clocks together, we were able to deduce and put bounds on various dark matter uh, coupling coefficients. And this is presented here by this red curve. It may seem that um, the sensitivity of our experiment is uh, suppressed relative to other experiments in the field. But I, I should underline that all of those experiments use very basic um, analysis to uncouple those uh, coefficients. And our technique employs a more general coefficient separation technique. So it's a more stringent bound in this sense. <clears throat> now I move on to uh, something else. And this is related to weakly interacting massive particles. Um, so this is the plot which I have already shown to you. So I explained various experiments at this end of the story, but uh, now I, I want to shift here. So as you can see, there is a huge gap between uh, between low mass experiments like exon searches and um, more probably more traditional ways of detecting uh, dark matter on this end. And there is a gap, and still have to do something with this. And this is related to the cryogenic detector R&D uh, work within the center. And this is the work we collaborate on with uh, the University of Melbourne. Um, so this is a type of exclusion plot, which is used uh, for uh, WIMPs. Uh, again, this is uh, WIMP mass. Uh, here we are talking about GeV, hundreds of GeV uh, masses. And this is cross-section or coupling. And these are various experiments in the field, famous ones like xenon one ton, dharma uh, crest. Um, and there are two ways to push uh, further from this exclusion uh, limits. One is to go down, um, put uh, the, the idea how to do this is pretty clear. You need more, fewer backgrounds, more exposure, heavier targets, and you can eventually achieve the coherent neutrino back, uh, background. But moving uh, to the left from, from this exclusion plot is much harder because basically you need to invent a new type of detector because traditional detectors are not very sensitive. They, they have a very steep rollout from their sensitivity. So here we need lower thresholds and lighter targets. So this is uh, the three pillars of beam detection. So uh, we are talking here about the direct detection scheme. So we have standard model particles interacting with a dark matter particle via some new physics. And uh, these dark matter particles uh, leaves a imprint on, on the behavior of standard model particle, which we can detect in an experiment. Typically, we are talking about either nuclear recoil or electron recoil events. And as a um, a result, we can measure either lights, ionization, or heat. Uh, so we are talking about phonons, photons, or ions. For ions, we measure currents. For photons, we, we use um, photomultipliers. Uh, but what I'm going to present you today is how to improve uh, phonon detection. So typically here, we have a crystal, um, crystal absorber where the uh, interaction happens. Uh, due to this interaction, uh, the physics produces uh, various phonons, which uh, we can detect using uh, transition. Uh, typically, people use transition edge superconducting uh, sensor, uh, which are on the surface of this uh, absorber crystal. Uh, so a typical experiment looks like this. So this is either germanium or silicon crystal. And you can see a pattern here, which is uh, your detector. And uh, 
since we need to change the targets, people uh, talk about other crystals like sapphire, lithium fluoride, gallium arsenide, quartz, etc. And uh, sapphire crystal looks like this. So um, this is uh, not a dark matter detector, but this is a clock uh, crystal. So th this is what we use for cryogenic uh, uh, clock oscillator. And this is uh, the purest uh, sapphire crystal we can get on the market. And we use it as a clock. And you can see that it has very similar ideas. Um, but we have to do something with the uh, detection as well. Transitionally, as I said, people use uh, transition edge sensors, uh, but they have uh, very important problems, especially for lower energies. And the problem is, since you put your detector on the surface of your observer, there is a, a thermal resistance between the uh, observer crystal and the detector. And once you uh, decrease the energy of your events, this uh, resistance becomes more and more important and the scheme becomes less and less effective. So the ideas we have are related to um, um, the, the, the idea that we have to do something with this and why not to use something intrinsic to the uh, observer rather than something uh, external to it. So we can use either spin ensembles, we can dope our crystals with, on, with some uh, ions, uh, we can use masers or clocks. So uh, the uh, um, ion spin ensemble idea was proposed a long time ago in 1987 where they used uh, erbium doped YAG, which is a popular optical crystal, by the way. And the idea is that uh, though those phonons uh, induced by dark matter would flip uh, spins in, in the solid, and instead of measuring um, temperature of the crystal, why don't, don't we measure magnetic field produced by those uh, events uh, with uh, spins? And this was laid down back in 1987. Uh, in our work, in our lab, we also use these crystals and at low temperatures and uh, using microwave modes, we can observe uh, where is um, uh, spin interaction in the crystals. So we want to investigate this scheme for uh, wind detection. Uh, we can take this idea to even further and use masers. So uh, the uh, for example, a maser based on iron ion in sapphire. It has a, a lambda scheme, and we can use this scheme to um, make a maser. And this maser was demonstrated in, in this work back in 2008. Um, why maser is because it, this is a, uh, is a threshold system, uh, like a transitional edge sensor. So. Um, we can tune our maser to a point near the threshold and observe temperature variations uh, due to uh, by measuring uh, output signal. So either we have no amazing or amazing uh, by working near the threshold. So the detector would look like a perfect uh, microwave uh, clock in a crystal like this. Uh, something very similar. Uh, this is a nonlinear clock where we, uh, we can pump uh, the crystal and induce, and induce the um, thermal bistability. This thermal bistability was demonstrated in 2010 in, again in Sapphire. And the idea here is uh, your system can be either in this high transmission state or lower transmission state, depending on the temperature. And again, this is a threshold system, which is uh, similar to transition edge sensors, but uh, it's, uh, it has nothing external to the observer crystal. So everything is in, within the crystal. Um, uh, there's a very interesting uh, idea of using superfluids for dark matter detection and superfluids are very good for dark matter detection because they are very clean and they produce uh, lots of signals due to interaction with various particles. For example, in this work here, it was proposed to use for neutrino detection. If neutrino comes and induce, interacts with the superfluids, it can produce various signals like not only phonons, like in a solid, but also rosons, which is something very specific to superfluids. It can produce electrons, bubbles, things like that. And these things we can uh, measure on the surface of the superfluid. 
Um, we are working hard on this scheme and um, this is our first uh, superfluid helium uh, measurements at UWA. So we have a microwave resonator uh, and we put uh, some superfluid in it and you can see uh, some helium and you can see that when we decrease the temperature around two Kelvin, we see the uh, trans uh, transition of the helium from uh, gas into the superfluid and we can measure that by measuring frequency of this cavity. And this is transmission for the cavity on res on, on uh, below the superfluid transition and above the superfluid transition. Um, there are also quite a few other uh, ideas. Uh, people pu keep publishing papers on how to detect dark matter using various solid state phenomena, like for example, uh, optical phonons. Uh, this is again using a special type of transition edge sensors, magnons, um, basically spin waves in solids. Uh, they also propose to use um, defects in crystal in, in the optical range. Um, by doing uh, spectroscopy of those crystals. And uh, other ideas are related to uh, uh, superconductors and various quasi-particles in superconductors. Um, so uh, there is a lot to do in, in the field. And uh, it, at this point, it's still not clear which approach would be the best for light wimp detection. Uh, in the end, I want to uh, show you again this uh, um, mass scale. So on one end, we have very famous, very big experiments like Sabre, Xenon, Wanton, on LHC, and they are doing a very great job in excluding uh, dark matter candidates on this high energy end. But we also have um, very small, comparatively small experiments on this end uh, using uh, very precision, uh, very low noise precision metrology like frequency metrology and uh, compact uh, uh, mechanical oscillators to exclude dark matter on this end. Um, so uh, both worlds at some point uh, would need to collide somewhere here. And at, at this point, we just don't know where the uh, dark matter is, uh, but it is somewhere. So we still need to find it. So that's, uh, that's all for me uh, at the moment. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That was terrific talk, Maxim. Thanks very much. Thank you. I don't even know where Wally is in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But, but, but so he's there. He's, he's there somewhere. Okay, excellent. So for those of you who are just focusing, let's you can see if you can tell us where it is. Um, the question and answers are uh, open. So if you've got a question for Maxim on, on dark matter, uh, please feel free to jump in there with with a question. We, we have one already. So uh, uh, Kieran O'Hare has asked, with the upload download experiment, how would you test or veto a potential signal given that you have no magnetic field that you can turn off? Yep, we can play. Uh, there are a few knobs to do this. Uh, first of all, we can uh, change the power of one loop, and it has to be either proportional or inversely proportional to the power. So it's similar to uh, changing the, the B fields. But we also can play with the frequencies, and we can, for example, detune those frequencies more and, and see if uh, the signal is still there. So. There are quite a few ways to figure it out. Yeah. Excellent. I have a question. Um, I might jump in there just before the next uh, question from the attendees. Um, you've shown quite a number of uh, experimental techniques, and I, I noticed um, a lot of different time scales uh, uh, thrown up there. Things like one and a half years, 120 hours, 153 days. You know, I guess that the length of time for each experiment is very different. Yes. So what are the shortest experiments and would you repeat some of the shortest experiments for reliability? And then what are the longest experiments that you're performing? So um, first, we always start with a short experiment just to see that it works, that we don't have any uh, technical issues. Uh, for example, something might just stop working in the middle of the experiment. And that typically takes days, probably. Um, 
yeah and, and then we are we want to prepare much longer experiments like this rotating oscillator experiment has been run for years because it's just so reliable that we don't need to change anything so uh yeah we we'll start with something short and then we try to make it reliable to run for a very long time so a typical time scale would be uh <laughs> on the order of a year <laughs> And, and how does that affect when you're trying to keep things at very, very low temperatures and high magnetic fields? You know, how do you sustain those sorts of, you know, 12 to 14 Tesla fields down into the dilution type temperatures? Yeah, uh, so um, a dilution fridge can run for a very long time on its, uh, on its own. So it may, maybe a year or so, uh, but we always, always have some, um, power surges <laughs> in our lab. So uh, we have to turn it off uh, regularly, but, but, but it doesn't affect uh, the surge too much because we can warm up everything and cool down again. Uh, we don't have to have a continuous trace of data. Um, so um, it's okay. a bit so harder if, if you have to fields. stop it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, uh, usually it's not a problem. Um, it, it takes time, but on the order of days, comparing to years, it's <laughs> not so important. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So we have another another question here from um, Ben Kosselter. Uh, if you were to place a bet, which of the things that you have talked about do you think is the leading candidate for discovering the true nature of dark matter? Well, good question, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I would say uh, 26.6 gigahertz axion signal. Um, this is uh, the, um, uh, there's a claim that uh, it has been observed in Johnson junctions. The experiment is very contradictory. So m most people do not believe in it, but uh, it's a, a very good range for axions. So I, it might just happen that it's where um, it's, uh, otherwise, anything is as good as anything else. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a fan of axions, to be honest. Excellent, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the attendees? Feel free to pop them in the, the question and answer uh, panel. Or if you feel like you found Wally on this page, jump in and tell us where he is. So um, I was quite interested to see your discussions about the, um, in the last few slides, about the phonons and the magnons as a possible mm. uh, mechanism of observing these things. Um, through what methods would you be would, would you be measuring these things through sort of um, optical methods like Raman or, or something like terahertz spectroscopy or? That, that's a very good question. The theorists who work on this kind of thing, uh, they basically um, uh, deal with dark matter interacting with the solid state phenomenon, but they do not consider how we detect those things. So this is still an open question, how we would detect uh, those magnon or uh, optical phonons. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. That, that's, a, okay. Uh, that's a big unknown, yeah. I, I, I'll um, uh, let you know why I asked that question. <laughs> um, I work at ANSTO and I, I do inelastic neutron scattering. So mm. I'm measuring phonons and magnons with neutron scattering. Mm. Um, but perhaps that's not the correct method, spectroscopic method for this, um, this particular case. Yeah, we're looking for single events, so uh, yeah, uh, that might be not so sensitive to. Uh, no, that's right. I, again, it's a time issue as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. How long you but, can sit and just wait and measure for? Yeah, but 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 the problem is there is nothing there, so <laughs> there's nothing to compete with. So uh, mm. any yes. idea would be very helpful. So if, if you have any ideas of, on any of these experiments, it would be great to discuss. 
Um, yeah. As, as you might see, uh, most of our ideas are just, uh, let's use one of our devices in our lab and let's put a bond on this or, or that theory. So if you have, uh, but basically the idea of this talk is if you have a very sensitive experiment, uh, you can find the theory somewhere which uh, you can put bounds on. And uh, because there is so much in the theory uh, that we, we need more experiments, basically. Um, right, yes, excellent. Um, and finally, um, I was very impressed with your sapphire crystal. That is stunning. Yeah. It is so transparent. Yes, yes. This clock, yes. So we uh, impurities are on the order of points per billion. And, um, wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah and, no, beautiful. And with this uh, micro technique, we can detect those um, uh, concentrations. So it's very sensitive to very, very low concentrations, primarily because the sapphire is an excellent microwave material. It doesn't have uh, loss of loss mechanisms, so it's very, very good. Okay, beautiful. So we've had two people jump in there. Thanks, Steve and Ezard. Um, Wally is almost in the exact dead center, and Wally is yeah. below the second E in the wares to the left of the striped booth. Mm. Oh, I see him. Here we go. Just just for fun. Yeah. I, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's sort of hiding behind something just, just in yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there any further questions before we before we finish up uh, today? I don't see any others coming through. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much, Maxim, and, and thanks everybody uh, for coming along again this week. Again, apologies for last week with the technical difficulties, and I'm, I'm really pleased everybody came back again this week. Um, it was a fascinating talk. I have learned so much. There is so much that you're working on. It's phenomenal. Mm. So thanks again. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks everybody.